The origin of Venezuela's current political polarization lies in the 1990s, in how its old traditional political parties disintegrated and in how they were replaced. So the period we're looking at now, 89 to 94, is a time of disintegration and crisis. Venezuelan politics has traditionally been dominated by two political parties, the center-left Social Democratic Acción Democrática and the center-right Christian Democratic Cope. As background to their demise in the 90s, you need to understand that Venezuela is a major oil exporter, and because of that the story really begins in the 1970s, when oil prices were still high and life was good. Venezuela's capital Caracas is also known as Paris of South America. Because of its abundance of oil, Venezuela is booming and rich in opportunities. But then in the 1980s, oil prices plummeted, which led to a lot of economic troubles in Venezuela, and by the end of the decade, one third of people had been thrown below the national poverty line. In 1988, a social democrat stood for elections who had been president during the oil bonanza, Carlos Andres Pérez. Hopes were high that he'd bring Venezuela back to economic prosperity. Pérez ran his election campaign decidedly as a social democrat, roundly condemning the austerity policies suggested to Venezuela by the World Bank and the IMF. However, after winning the election, only weeks into his presidency, he announced the implementation of just such an IMF structural adjustment program. Now it's important to understand the economics behind this situation, but nevertheless, imagine this. Poverty and tensions are already high and now a social democrat president implements an austerity program. In the eyes of many, this was seen as a major betrayal by Acción Democrática and looked like it had shifted to the right. So that means that after the austerity package, there was no longer a credible center-left party. The first step of the IMF package was an increase of petrol prices, which led to an increase of bus fares. Especially for students, this was the last straw and kicked off the 1989 so-called Caracazo. On Monday, the 27th of February, what started in the morning as disruptive actions in a major bus terminal organized mainly by students and was aimed not only at bus fares but at the IMF package in general, spread to widespread rioting and lootings in many cities. Public order disintegrated. These protests and riots took Pérez by surprise, which in itself is surprising. His government reacted only the next day, when looting had gone on throughout the night and spread to nearly all major cities, with people chanting slogans like the people are hungry and people are angry and no more deception. Now Pérez took out a sledgehammer. He suspended constitutional guarantees and enacted Plan Avila, which is a military contingency plan ordering the military to restore public order. This crackdown included widespread incidences of soldiers firing wantonly into residential buildings and crowds of people killing unarmed civilians, especially in working class areas. Until today it's unknown how many exactly died. Confirmed deaths circle around 300 to 400 deaths, but there are reasonable estimates which go from 1 to 3,000 deaths. Against this backdrop of the Caracazo, three years later in 1992, then Lieutenant Colonel Hugo Chavez decided to take matters into his own hands and mobilized fellow army members to oust the elected government. He was imprisoned after his first attempt failed. Compañeros, lamentablemente, por ahora, los objetivos que nos planteamos no fueron logrados en la ciudad capital. Oigan al comandante Chávez que les lanza este mensaje para que por favor reflexionen y te pongan las armas, porque ya en verdad los objetivos que nos hemos trazado a nivel nacional es imposible que los logremos. Compañeros, oigan este mensaje solidario, les agradezco su lealtad, les agradezco su valentía, su desprendimiento y yo ante el país y ante ustedes asumo la responsabilidad de este movimiento militar bolivariano. Later the same year, his supporters attempted another coup and failed again. 
at least 145 people died, mostly in the second attempt. There are essentially two narratives about these events. The Pérez government saw the Caracazo as the breakdown of social order and mob violence against which it tried to establish order again. From this perspective, what Chávez did in the 92 coup was little more than to conspire against an elected government. To our knowledge, Pérez denied until his death that the Caracazo had anything whatsoever to do with the IMF package. Chávez, on the other hand, saw in the Caracazo the rebellion of the Venezuelan people against the IMF program, in response to which the government massacred its own people. From this perspective, the coup in 92 is in defense of the people against an oppressive government. Both perspectives contain half-truths. Contrary to Pérez, the Caracazo definitely had to do with the IMF packet. The initial disruptions were explicitly organized against the packet and all accounts agreed that the first looters came mostly from the poor, working and lower middle classes, who were also those hit most by the price rises of the packet. Poverty had been grinding on them since 1983 and now the government seemed to turn against them as well. It was the drop that spilt an already full glass. Estos son los barrios marginales de la ciudad de Caracas. En estos cerros, donde la pobreza se disimula en el verdor del paisaje, vive la mayor parte de la gente humilde de esta ciudad. Esta es la gente que los días lunes, martes y miércoles bajó desde sus cerros enfurecida hacia la ciudad y desató una ola de saqueo y de pillaje que ha dejado pérdidas incalculables. La reacción de la policía y del ejército luego de los días de saqueo ha sido terrible. Patrullas del ejército han incursionado violentamente en estos barrios marginales, buscando a los que participaron en los saqueos. Yet at the same time, contrary to Chávez, the Caracaza was not simply a spontaneous rebellion by oppressed people. The lootings quickly spread to middle class neighborhoods and from the third day onwards there are reports of armed groups, some even in police uniforms, arriving in trucks to take away entire stocks of shops. And shops by foreigners were particularly vulnerable. There is no denying that this was an unsustainable breakdown of social order. And much of the blame for this goes to the various police forces, which by and large reacted too late or not at all. So the Caracazo was an institutional breakdown both of politics and the police. To us it represents what happens in a society when conflicts aren't channeled into either a political constructive process or controlled by the police. Chaos ensues and nobody profits. After the Caracazo and Chávez's coup attempt, Acción Democrática took a further blow in August 93 when Pérez was removed from office by Congress on a corruption charge. In the ensuing election, Copé for its part couldn't take advantage because it would have had to move to a center-left position to mop up Acción Democrática's disgruntled voters. Its long-standing leader, Rafael Caldera, tried exactly that, but couldn't convince Copé's leadership. Caldera then left Copé and won the 93 elections with the new party he founded on a center-left position. So ideologically speaking, the old two parties now looked pretty much like the same old discounted thing. The 93 elections were also new in another respect. Whereas historically around 75% went voting, 93 marked the first of many elections after the Caracazo when only half the population went voting. As a result of all of this, during the 90s poverty continued to rise and the two established parties lost nearly all of their support. A widespread perception was now that they form part of a corrupt elite which cares little for the plight of normal people and in their place new political parties emerged. Among them was the colonel who unsuccessfully tried to overthrow the elected government in 92, Hugo Chavez. <laughs> 